Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I was introducing uh, this particular slide in which I'm showing a picture uh, where you can discern a number of things from this picture. Uh, the picture has a reality and it has got some perceptions, of course, but the reality has to be discerned from what you can perceive here. Uh, in reality, the picture is just showing trees, twigs, nests, and some birds. But you are able to see an image from that. But the reality is that there's only a background, trees, birds, and nests. So as we begin to share, it is important that uh, we realize that uh, uh, first with the same reality, we perceive things differently. And I was saying that uh, what normally happens is that uh, in the medical school, we have had so many uh, cohorts. And over time, we have started to, of course, exchange ideas and share uh, many things about the state of medical education in Zambia. What I was emphasizing was that it is important to bring these discussions into public forum, rather than hush hush behind the back steam discussions. Because when they are in public forum, it gives us an opportunity to meaningfully engage so that the different stakeholders can take into account the different views that are there. But also by putting things in public, it does give an opportunity for people to verify some of the assertions that ground our opinions. And it also gives us an opportunity to look at the factual nature of the things that we are sharing. So in a bit of my background that I have a keen eye for medical education, apart from qualifications in medical education at master's and doctorate level, I am a fellow of the Academy of Medical Educators of the United Kingdom a fellow of the Foundation for the Advancement of International Medical Education and Research out of Philadelphia in the USA. And I'm also a fellow of the Education Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates. I was once a senior advisor to the president of the World Federation for Medical Education. So I have had some exposure with regard to medical education on the continent, in the US, in Europe, and in Australia. So perhaps uh, it has been such that I'm able to compare different aspects of uh, what is happening in the medical education uh, fraternity. So what I'll try and do today is basically uh, synthesize what I have synthesized about medical education, and I'll present these as the seven truths for medical education in Zambia. After that, of course, I will interlace my discussion with the strides for medical education and the challenges for medical education. So let's begin with the key milestones in medical education in Zambia. I'll begin with this timeline. If you look at this timeline, you see that uh, medical education in Zambia has existed from 1966 all the way to current day 2023. In 1964, Zambia got its independence. So already you are beginning to place yourselves on this continuum where you are in the medical fraternity. So the medical school opened in 1966. The first graduate, uh, graduates were in 1973. And it was just a class of 11 people, 11, 13, thereabout. 1973, in, until 1977, we began to have the first few people who had graduated from UNSA School of Medicine going abroad to go and study, mostly in the United Kingdom. Now, I want you to signpost this progress. Those first few graduates went to the United Kingdom and studied uh, programs like the membership of the Royal College of Physicians, fellowship in the Royal College of Surgeons, 
member of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecology. Towards the end of 1980, they had started to trek back to Zambia, and these people who now had postgraduate education were beginning to become the faculty for the University of Zambia School of Medicine. Now remember, by that time, there's only one medical school in Zambia. Through the initiative of the School of Medicine, after collaborative discussions with the other universities in East and Central Africa, the MMED program was started. Because this cohort of people started to think that we needed to localize postgraduate training. It was very expensive to send all the people who were earmarked for postgraduate training to go to the United Kingdom and other countries. And also, there was a high attrition. If Zambia sent 10 people for studies in the United Kingdom, maybe two or three returned. So there was an impetus to localize medical education, postgraduate training in Zambia. So the Master of Medicine uh, was initiated. At the time, postgraduate education could only be anchored in universities because that's where we were training doctors. So you will see in this timeline that 1981 MH started by 1985, we're beginning to get the first graduates. And I must hasten to mention that at the time when the MH started, Zambian graduates were very reluctant to join the MH because they wondered why others had gone up outside the country to go and train and they were being asked to train here locally. So in a nutshell, in the initial years, people shunned the MMED. So from 1985 onward, we now have a dual system. We are getting people who are coming from abroad, who are coming with membership of the Royal College or fellow of the Royal College, be it obstetrician, pediatrics and child health and uh, uh, surgery and internal medicine. But locally, we are training MMED. Now, I also want you to put it in context that people, the early classes were, like I said, the first intake was 13. By 1990, we were graduating about 35 doctors. Later on, the numbers began to increase to 50 to the current numbers. So on this timeline, uh, I want to particularly talk about the University of Zambia School of Medicine interaction with the World Federation of Medical Education Standards for the first time. And I'll share the results of that self-evaluation. Another important milestone on this timeline is 2009 going into 2011, because now we begin to see the first uh, instance of private medical schools in Zambia. We also begin to see the creation of new public universities in Zambia. Yeah. So uh, by 2011, we get the existence of Copper Belt Medical University, medical school. You get private universities, Rusaka Apex, Cavendish University of Zambia coming to the fore. And over the time, we get Mulungushi Medical School, we get Levi Mwanawasa Medical School, and we get several other private medical schools to the situation where we currently are of nine medical schools. Now let's focus to postgraduate training. By 2010, the ministers in the Eastern Central African region come to a conclusion that our postgraduate program being harbored in universities is not having a sufficient throughput. The number of people they are graduating is not enough. So they decide to form the Eastern Central Southern Africa College of Health Sciences. So when you hear people say that I'm a fellow of COXEXA, College of Surgeons of East, Central and Southern Africa, and you can see in ophthalmology, in anesthesia, 
all this ending with the EXA. So by 2017, Zambia has also come on board with the Eastern Central African College of Health Sciences, a model of collegiate training, to which I shall speak more, and the specialty training program, the STP, is born in Zambia. Fast forward to 2023. Now we have unemployed doctors. At a time when students were graduating at medical school, the Ministry of Health used to send a minibus and trucks to collect doctors and send them to the hospitals. 2023, we are now having 1,500 doctors waiting to be employed. So the scenario has totally changed. We have now huge student numbers. When previously you could only have 13, 35, from an intake of 500 in first year, it was very competitive, such that to be a medical school was a badge of honor. You had really competed and have succeeded. 2023, the investor of Zambia, for instance, admitted 1,000 700 medical students direct entry. And the results just came out recently, only 256 were managed to proceed. So the scenario has changed. So this is the, the timeline. Now, when we put this in context, I'll share my synthesis of what I'm calling the seven truths. I believe that this form the basic foundation of anyone understanding any discussion or debate in the medical fraternity. Here is my truth number one. Medical education should be located in the context of health systems. If you look at the diagram that is shown now there, health systems are the vehicle or is the vehicle which service delivery is provided. Now, for the health system to function, one of the important components is the human workforce. This health workforce, you see they are abbreviated HWF, essentially constitutes the pipeline. This is where you are training people to go and work in the health systems to deliver health services. The other components are a discussion for another time. But regarding this health workforce, you also have the element of specialist training. In view of pipelines, we have two, undergraduate and postgraduate, or joining the health system to deliver. So why is it important to locate medical education in the health context? Here is an example. This is adapted from the World Bank. The labor market will basically dictate the demand and supply for doctors. Now, this is divorced from the need. There is a doctor-patient ratio, which defines how many doctors the country needs. At the time of independence for a population of 4 million, we were training 13 doctors. It was going to take 40 years before you could even begin to approximate the number of doctors you need. By, 20, by 1990, we are training 35 doctors for the population of 7 million. So the need will de define, is defined by the disease burden, the curative services that are needed to be provided together with the preventive services. So if you have a disjoint between the demand and the need, you are going to have a mismatch. And of course, people do not get quality health services when they need them. Demand and supply. When the system is able to employ doctors and absorb and have capacity to pay them, then you get the required numbers. But if you have a huge supply, but in terms of absorptive rates, either because of capacity to pay or the number of employers, you now get a mismatch between the supply and the people who are graduating. So it is important that medical educators are always aware of the human capital needs of the country. 
so many institutions are being opened to train clinical officers. When the policy level for the ministry might be that they do not need this cadre anymore, they are transitioning to licentiates. So that disjoint is what I'm speaking about with regards locating medical education in the health context. Now, here is an example of what I was speaking about, which the ministers reacted to, the ministers of health for Eastern Central Africa. Take Zambia, for example. From 1966 to 2016, Zambia had graduated the 259 doctors or 263, there about. In a period of 50 years, we had trained only 259 specialists. With the introduction of the collegiate training system, in a space of four years, Zambia has been able to graduate 102 specialists. Now, at 50, on average 50 per year, we are talking about 700 doctors specialists at that same level. This is what is going to lead me to the second truth. This second truth must be clearly comprehended. What is the nature of training for the doctor? MBCHB, people need to understand that this degree is a hybrid of professional training and academic training. Until you understand that difference between professional training and academic training, we'll always get ourselves tied in a knot when understanding postgraduate education. Now, let me unpack it for you. A professional training is like training somebody for practice. You are preparing somebody for the workplace. Many of you will remember that in the accounting profession, people had to do SCCA, which was considered the professional qualification. And others would do BSc accounting. But depending on the need of the employer, they would say, we want a chartered accountant and not one with BSc accounts. Because the chartered accountant was prepared to function in the workplace. When you have an academic qualification, this is where the foundations of theory, the scientific foundation is emphasized. There's a lot of debate in the country now about how we have learned irrelevant things in our education when we don't need them when we graduate. It is a clear lack of understanding between the differentiation between a professional qualification and an academic qualification. You did calculus in first year. Some people argue that a doctor may never need the calculus, but you are in a university, university from universal, universal training of the mind to extend your capacity to show you what is possible and to understand the world better. You are an engineer. You still need to know about reproduction. You still need to know about how the world works. So academic qualifications, basic biomedical sciences, anatomy, physiology, will be based on a scientific foundation. And then from there, the art, medicine is developed. So you can see in medical school, there's a divine a, a, a diagonal line which is showing clinical sciences and basic sciences. Now, when you go to postgraduate, some postgraduate programs emphasize the clinical practice. This is what is called the collegiate system. It is not an academic qualification. And I'll explain why it is not called an academic qualification. Whilst on the other hand, if it is, the system is harbored in the university, they want you to be a researcher. They want you to be a scholar in addition to your practice. So how do you differentiate the key performance indicators between the two? If you are in the clinical arena, you could be an orthopedic surgeon doing 100 hip replacements a year. When it comes to the academy, you have zero publications. They will not consider you for promotion because you are a clinician. Similarly, if you are an academic, 
you have zero publication, but you are doing 100 re hip replacements, the academy will not recognize your efforts because your key performance is research and publication. Now, of course, there are some people who straddle between the two. So you have to be clear. What is important is clarity. What is this profession postgraduate training trying to achieve? And I hope this explains that the truth number three, postgraduate training has got mainly two pathways. There's the university academic qualification route, and there is the professional clinical focus. So you see on this slide that you get admitted by the University of Zambia. You either, when you are a postgraduate, you can take clinical or non-clinical master's programs, master of surgery, master of PIDs. On the non-clinical, you can do an MSc in anatomy, a PhD in biochemistry. Those who are doing the clinical, then rotate. They have to be in the service delivery area. So they are rotating in a hospital. Whilst the collegiate training system, as you can see from this slide, after internship, you go into residency. A community of specialists take over and begin to focus on you acquiring clinical skills. One of your key performance indicators will obviously not be 10 publications. That is scholarship. So you will see that after residency, registrarship, you can then now go into fellowship and further super specialize within a specialist uh, medical practice. So in summary, academic qualifications will give you MSc, MMed, PhD, and they have to have in them a theoretical background where you produce a thesis, you produce a research, the scholarly outputs in addition to your clinical practice. Whilst on professional certification of competency, you are getting things like member of Royal College of Surgeons, member of fellow of Royal College of Physicians with a focus on hands-on clinical competence. In some countries, if you have a professional qualification and want to join the university, they will tell you that your focus is clinical. Similarly, if I am an, an academic and I want to join the clinical area, I have 10 publications, but I've only done two hip replacements, and I want you to appoint me as a consultant orthopedic surgeon, there's a mismatch there. So what we need is clarity of understanding right from the nature of the hybrid nature of our uh, MBCHB. Okay, that sorts out the issue of our background, the training we have received and how to interpret it when we are going for postgraduate training. So we must now focus on quality. We understand that we are training in medical schools we understand that you could be training in a community of practice of specialists, which will give you collegiate training. So how do we ensure that there is quality in the institution which you are being trained? And case in point, Zambia now has nine medical schools. How do we ensure that there's quality in those medical institutions? So the World Federation for Medical Education is a global organization which looks at the state of medical education worldwide. It has got chapters in Africa, Latin America, Northern America, Europe, and uh, Australia. And this is where I said that I happen to have had the privilege of being a senior advisor to the president of the World Federation for Medical Education. So in, 19, in 2004, University of Zambia Medical School got the standards of the World, Federal, uh, World Federation for Medical Education and said, how can we as a medical school perform against these standards? So we did a self-evaluation in preparation for external accreditation. The story is if you are a chef in the restaurant and people have just had a meal, you don't go to them and tell them, I am the chef, you have enjoyed your meal. 
it is for them to tell you their experience with the meal. And that's why external accreditation is important. So how did UNSA School of Medicine do? You can look at all those nine parameters. We needed five stars because these are basics, but we did not meet at all any of those standards. So we said to ourselves, there's work to do. This is how come we raised the alarm. The University of Zambia Senate was informed, Parliamentary Committee on Health was informed, and I'm just showing a slide of uh, the, the problems uh, from the Parliamentary Committee report when they were informed that the School of Medicine needed assistance. This was reported, this is a, a clip from the post, School of Medicine declining, declining standards. So we acknowledged the problem and we wanted things to be done. Now, this is what external accreditation does for you, is that it puts standards at the fore of your agenda. The fifth truth, licensure is a cornerstone of practice of quality. This is just the top part of uh, a memo that was sent by the Health Professions Council of Zambia, dated 28th April, 2022, in which they were, HPCZ reintroduces licensure examination for fresh graduates. What are they trying to cure now? We have nine universities in Zambia and the standards are not identical. If we look at academic staff, if we look at infrastructure, we look at access to service delivery uh, centers, we look at access to resources, how you support your curriculum, your program, your students, access to ICT, access to web-based things, and how the whole thing is coordinated. It is not the same. It is very varied. So expectedly, the quality of people coming out of each of these institutions will be different. So how does HPCZ, which is the vanguard of the Zambian population in terms of safety, provide for reassurance that the people who are practicing are safe? So this is why the licensure exam is something that the medical fraternity has supported. Let's have at least a minimum check where we can say that the person that is going to practice has met the standard. In the US, you have to have a license in the state in which you are practicing. In the UK, they use the fact that you have graduated from an accredited institution that you can practice. Now underline accredited. But in our situation, we also have internationally qualified doctors who are coming from China, who are coming from Congo, who are coming from wherever, where we have no idea the nature of that institution. How do we ensure that these people are safe to practice? And this is why you see that if you want to go to South Africa or you want to go to the US, if you come from Zambia, you want to go to the UK, you are required to sit the club. You are required to sit the USLME so that people can see that you have reached the minimum threshold. That's my fifth truth. The sixth truth of the seven truth is also important to understand. And I did allude to it earlier. The medical profession is essentially a triple helix in terms of how you progress. We all start together in the medical school and over the line, some people will follow the line of the clinician. These are people who spend their lives dedicated to service delivery. They are on the world. They are saving lives. They are coming up with public health interventions. They are saving lives. So clinicians stroke public health specialists. Then there's another strand which others follow. And that is the strand of scholarship. You end up in an area where you are now focusing on research. You're focusing on publications. 
and your key performance, you are now an educator, stroke scholar. Then, of course, there are those that follow the line of health institution administration. They become administrators, senior medical superintendent, provincial health director, permanent secretary, ministry of health. These are administrators. Now, you need clarity. If I'm a clinician, I'm on the ward, then there is an academic opportunity. I then now want to become a professor because I have spent 30 years on the ward. Now, this is where we have to be clear that the key performance indicators, you find that in the university are different. When they ask for your CV, they want to look at the number of publications. How many scholarly activities have you done? What is your research background? How are you skilled as an educator? Are you able to deliver the material? Do you understand issues about assessment, curriculum development? Clearly, I may not have that if I've spent 30 years on the world. Similarly, if I've been in the scholarly world, I've been doing publications, doing research. Then I want to go on the ward and be appointed the consultant. Consultant orthopedic surgeon, when in the entire 30 years of my life, I've only had four hip replacements. But I was studying the effects of infection in post-operative aspect, and I narrowed down on a field. Am I suitable for a consultant? Again, it could be the issue of an administrator. You focused on administration. You have risen all the way in the health administration hierarchy. Nothing else. Then from there, you want to, when you go to the academy, because you say, I occupied the highest office in admin, I should be appointed this level. So that clarity is important. Now, what I've been trying to say is that each of these must be certified. Professionalize them. If you're a clinician, get licensure. If you're an academic scholar, get accredited as an educator. If you're an administrator, get some administrative qualification. And I like to, I mean, look at this picture. For those of you who can see this picture, you can see one of the fellows uh, that followed the admin uh, profile. You can see clearly that uh, that look can only have been acquired by somebody who has been trained <laughs> in administration, <laughs> yeah? So that clarity is important. So the last truth is change. Change is the only constant in medical education. And when change comes, it is messy. Change affects people. Change affects structures, it affects systems, it affects the way we do our business, it affects the way people progress. So, of course, change is something that will cause people to want to either resist it or support it based on their perceived uh, benefits or disadvantages. Those are the seven truths. I believe that once one has grappled with these, they are able to, for lack of a better word, intelligently interact with the debates and discussions that are on the different medical fraternity fora regarding the standards of medical education. Once we grasp these, we can then begin to form informed opinions, opinions which we are happy to lay out in the public so that people can react to them. What does the future of medical education in Zambia look like? Now, look at this slide. We had one big giant in the medical fraternity, the invest of Zambia. From 1966 to 19 to up to 2010, it was the only medical school. Now we have nine. 
four public universities and five private universities. Our student population has swelled from 13, 35, 50 per year on average to having 1,500 medical students actively in training. That landscape is different. It means that there are opportunities, for example, for people to take careers in becoming scholars and educators. Because for these universities to function up to the name they purport to be, they must have academic staff. So people must start considering going into this profession. We also have 1,500 people that are going to be left onto the labor market for medical doctors. People must plan for them, to employ them. The need is not debatable. We need at least 10 consultants at each of the provincial hospitals, a minimum. Then that way, it is going to be uh, something that is going to make it possible for us to use all these centers as training institutions, especially when it comes to the clinical aspect of things. So the landscape has changed. We also have a community of profession or specialists, the Zambia College of Medicine, which is anchoring STP. At some point, people, some people felt it was competing with the MED when in fact it was complementary. If we clearly understand that the uh, academic qualifications, their professional qualifications, their hybrid qualifications, there is no reason why the two should not exist side by side and each one of them prosper to the fullest extent. All right, having said what I've said this afternoon, in terms of strides, in terms of some of the challenges we have faced, what does the future look like? One, I think technology is going to be one of the anchors. Doctors in the future will have to be able to interpret sophisticated technology. These days, when you go to a hospital, doctors hardly even touch you. The first thing is they send you for an MRI, they send you for a CT scan, they send you for the labs. And those of us from the old school are always crying that the standards have gone down. The doctor, I just told him I've got a headache, he wrote a prescription. He never even did the full examination, never got a full history. He would have sorted out my problem, the headache. But maybe he doesn't know that for the last 10 years, I've been walking around with a huge spleen, spleen omega but because he never examined me. So yes, technology is coming, but it has to be put in context of quality. The future, if the university did pull it through the way they had tried to do the invest of Zambia to enroll 1,700 students, which lecture theater were you going to see to those students? How many synchronous concurrent lecture, lectures would you need to take to meet all their needs? The answer can only be e-learning, where people, the era of having one textbook of Ganong in the library is gone. People now have the textbooks on their laptops. They can access classrooms the way people are accessing online this particular presentation. So that is going to be the future. Skills lab are going to be the future. Patients are becoming more litigious. Patients are becoming more aware of their rights. Gone are the days when you learned how to cannulate on patients, actual patients, giving seven, eight tries to learn how to put an IV line on a patient. Examining people, pelvic examinations, doing this learning on the job. Now people have to acquire some level of proficiency by learning those skills in a skills lab. The ethical dilemmas that we faced in the 90s are going to be very different from the ethical dilemmas of the doctor of 2025 and beyond. Because technology is bringing in things like in vitro fertilization, mRNA vaccines, all those are ethical issues. People are going to have to contend with different stem cell research 
and other aspects. Euthanasia, an anthema many years ago is becoming common practice and is being legislated in many countries that a doctor can willfully end a life. When our oath said that we should not, we should save lives. Why did I say medical schools should be located in the health sector? Because we are going to have to respond to demographic and epidemiological data. Doctors are needed more in the rural areas than in the urban areas. Doctors are needed more for preventive care than for curative care. Doctors are needed more for well-being than for palliation. So we are going to have to respond to those things. If, if the, the country, each province, for example, to function needs three anesthetists, this is just as a way as an example. How can you then start a program and enroll 100 anesthetists? Where are they going to go after they graduate? How are they going to fit into your health system? Of course, unless you have a view that they'll go to other systems. And finally, my parting note is that medical education, both as a process and as a discipline, is going to take center stage. The Higher Education Authority has said that in order to teach in a medical school, you have to have some educational skill training, some pedagogical training. The University of Zambia has made it a policy. I don't know to what extent to implementation will going to be that you cannot become a lecturer if you don't have educational skills. In the UK, it's already standard. Minimum, you have to have an education in addition to your qualification to work in the university. Even the bar is being raised. Makerere, you can't now join the medical school minus a PhD. Minimum is PhD for Makerere. We still are getting masters. There are some universities in Africa which even employ people with a bachelor's as lecturers. So quality is increasingly going to be an issue. Offsite training is going to become important. Accreditation in 2010, Education Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates in the US said, starting 2023, you cannot join the American medical system if you do not come from an accredited medical school. In the past, the World Health Federation Organization used to produce a list called medical schools in the world. And it was enough just to exist. Now they are beginning to say, list of accredited medical schools. So no matter how we can placate ourselves, have 20 universities, if they are not accredited by a standard that is recognized regionally and internationally, our students will not go anywhere outside the precinct in which they have been trained. So accreditation is going to be a key driver in the future. Lastly, because of the interplay of joining the health system and other things, the role of politicians, bureaucrats, private universities, business interests, your board are going to be increasingly making demands on the faculty. And the faculty needs to know their place and ensure that academic standards are maintained. Thank you very much. I'll end there. Thank you. Please yeah. just give uh, Professor SSP another round of applause. Oh, thank you very much for that um, for that uh, wonderful lecture and walk through the history of uh, medical education in Zambia. And uh, I'm sure um, the audience here, we have uh, a lot of young doctors and uh, some medical students in the audience. I'm sure they have benefited from that rich background that was uh, presented by Professor Seger and Banda. Um, so we have, we have structured this interaction in, 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 in two ways. We are going to have two um, responses to this lecture. There were people that were 
actively and ardently listening to the presentation, and they would like to offer a five minutes response to this lecture. Uh, online, I've got um, uh, Dr. Francis Mupeta and uh, Dr. Kapoba Kocho, the two um, uh, students of the University of Zander School of Medicine, uh, but they took, took two different pathways. Uh, one completed uh, STP and the other one completed MED. So they are going to give us a feedback to this lecture. So Dr. Francis Mpeta, please, you can unmute yourself and uh, make your contribution. Thank you very much, uh, President, uh, Dr. Crispin Moyo. I also want to thank uh, Professor Sekelan Banda for his insights on medical education. Professor Banda is face of medical education, but it's something that he believes in. And I think uh, it's worth recognizing all the contributions that he has made uh, over the past decades. Um, my reaction to um, his presentation more, mainly will, will um, focus on the seven truths as he has called them. And, uh, and I think um, I, I would move further to, to look at uh, them as the seven pillars of medical education, because indeed he has summed up them very well. And uh, they form a fundamental uh, you know, uh, basis of medical training. Um, I will mix this uh, with experiences. So I, I said I'm going to give a reaction um, and mixing mostly with my experiences. And uh, I'll focus more on uh, postgraduate, and, and I'm sure probably maybe other speakers they look at, uh, you know, undergraduate, of which uh, currently we know there are so many uh, uh, differences. Uh, one thing that I, when I entered into the Department of Medicine, uh, you know, at the University of Zambia, and also practicing at the University Teaching Hospital, I, I found that uh, at postgraduate class is mainly uh, in the first year, and it's self-directed, uh, I could say, which is a very good experience because it fosters, you know, students to research on their own and, and, and you know, present in the context of the, uh, the topic of the day. Uh, basic sciences are reviewed, uh, you know, um, though uh, it is of, uh, disappointing to note that very few basic uh, science research is ongoing in our environment. And then um, some other thing that to note is that despite first year being um, basic science oriented, you find that the exams will take a turn and mostly uh, focus on clinical rather than application of basic science principles to clinical. So in that, in that regard, I think they were not really pretty much standards. And then we had, um, you know, uh, tutorials which were both clinical and uh, theoretical uh, mostly. Um, when it comes to, to research, uh, one of the biggest things I've failed to come to terms even up to now, and, and I've tried to start working and to, to do some work in this area, is that there are no formal uh, lectures on research. And the research is not uh, taught, it's not examined at a met compared to uh, you know, other universities out there. So that makes it optional and our graduates have ended up being weak in that area. And uh, we can see that not just our students, but also the supervisors, um, you know, most of whom do not understand the basic principles of research or research methodologies. And then there's also a generally lack of funding for research. I remember at one time Zeneme, uh, you know, discuss this, but I think it never came to um, uh, realization. Mentorship uh, is quite very weak program uh, in the uh, in uh, um, uh, in the uh, University of Zambia. Uh, if you find one, you will be lucky. But mostly, uh, there isn't that uh, you know a formalized way of um, mentorship and mentee. Examinations as well, they lack form and structure. They, 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 they have got no standard, sorry, in form and structure. This year, the examination will be in this format. The following year, it will be different. 
uh, and then you find that it will just be you know very confusing sometimes uh, you are not even warned that this year the exam is going to change or in structure or in form you just meet a different exam than what has been uh, you know known so it's very confusing then the requirements for one to qualify to sit for an exam also changes sometimes even based on personalities who is uh, sitting that year you know we ended up you know you you are going for an exam only to be told that you know you are disqualified to sit for this exam based on some cooked up reasons and then you find that the following year those things uh, change so that's really really uh, you know a weakness uh, in, in in standardization of of these things so uh, probably uh, one good thing is when it comes to this is that uh, the curriculum is there for the invest of zambia but of course, it's the, um, the, 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 the implementation that really, really has put a lot of things to, uh, you know, to, to, to be desired. Um, now, I think let me focus uh, in terms of my opinion and reaction, especially on the concept of training doctors of tomorrow today, uh, which will be uh, you know, very important if we are to introspect. Number one. Um, as Professor has said in his truth, number one, being, uh, you know, medical education, being in the context of the health system, this is very, very important. And the health system should be the Zambian health system and not any other health system. So in focusing for this going in the future, we have to now look at screening the type of students that we are accepting into our medical schools. Uh, so a, a screening should be applied at any entry level, be it at undergraduate, at postgraduate, at internship, you know, in other universities, all people entering into the medical profession are actually screened through interviews. In Zambia, it's free for all. I think that should, should change. Uh, and, and so many facets of screening should be used. And then uh, building a core team of lecturers, tutors, demo, clinical demonstrators and mentors will help the universities and the program to be strengthened. Like right now, we have got generally lack of lecturers. And even when you find lecturers, we don't have clinical demonstrators in these uh, you know, hospitals. We, we don't have mentors. And, and, and as such, it, it brings me to the fact that the, uh, the professors say that in certain universities like Makerere, you have to have a PhD. Now, where did somebody get a PhD? PhD if they do not get an academic mentorship. So we have to look at coming up with a strong staff development fellow, which should be one of the QC or QA uh, and accreditation points for university. Uh, I remember when I was just, uh, you know, applying for MMED, I indicated in my application that I had the strong desire to join the staff development uh, fellowship. I was not told exactly why I couldn't make the cut. But all I know is that, you know, a lot of under methods were, were done for me not to join that program. Then um, in terms of academic versus professional qualification, it's time we embraced both. And I think we have to look at uh, our graduates either could have STP or they could have MED and no one should look, uh, you know, or frown upon the other. Then um, standards in training. Let there be one. If, if it is possible, entry exam into medical school, let it be one, and then universities are going to select among those who have cleared a medical um, uh, uh, entry exam. And when it comes again to exit, let it be standard so that we have got a uniform type of cadre uh, and, and also qualification, and also strengthening on, on ethics and, 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 and research. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for that reaction, um, Dr. Mupesha. Uh, we, uh, I'm impressed with your commitment that in the midst of the work that you are doing, you have spare time to come and share with us. Uh, we appreciate. Um, we, we can also um, uh, have uh, Dr. Kapova to give uh, a five-minute response. Um, we are we over short on our time. Please, if you could just Give it five minutes and then we can we can conclude. Dr. Kapola. Thank you very much. Good uh, afternoon, everyone. My name's uh, Dr. Kapola Gocho. 
And um, basically, I'm here to just give a five minutes presentation on the STP training. I think initially we all know that there was a strong political will uh, to have or increase the number of postgraduate um, uh, students. And after that, um, probably especially so. The STP program was born from that and uh, the initial numbers were quite high of those who were admitted, but with the years we've seen um, a steady decline in the number of students. I'd like to mention from the beginning that the curriculum was, is very similar to the one used by UNSA except for the, um, the researcher component. So, um, Initially, I think there was more emphasis on the quantity and uh, not really the quality, but with time, we realized that there was an, a strengthening of the program so that there is quantity that has quality. Of course, initially we had mentors and trainers who were not really motivated to teach STP students and a number actually made their stance clear that the STP would go nowhere. Eventually, I think quite a number of colleagues who are doing STP were more tend into a workforce rather than a student because this is now the category that um, leveled the ground or rather provided an alternative to patients seeing a specialist. So this was a, now a critical workforce between the GRMOs, the SRMOs, and the consultants. Of course, we note that in most institutions, and especially those outside Lusaka, this force uh, really worked hard to provide the same specialist um, um, services to the uh, clientele out there. So there was generally an improvement in the quality of uh, care of patients that was given, especially in the eight other provinces other than Lusaka and Popa Bay, where we already had quite a number of um, um, specialists uh, already practicing. So we noted that in some, uh, some courses, I think the, the, the coordinators were um, doing quite well and having uh, even block lectures via Zoom, but in some programs, there was a lack of, and uh, it was also unfortunate in one or two centers, the program kick started without um, specialists. So I think with time, um, what was then made to strengthen those, um, um, to strengthen the teaching of those students who were in facilities where there were no teachers is that everybody was now required to do a rotation either at UTH uh, or Lady Manawasa. But we also noted that um, the 2020, rotations were quite strong and well organized more than the 2021 um, uh, rotations and with this I think there is need for us to strengthen the rotations for the students coming from outside UTH and Lady Monawasa because the, plan, the, the, the burden of diseases is quite different and also the quality and the number of the tutors, mentors and teachers is quite different from those uh, who are at the facilities uh, outside Osaka to those who are in Osaka. So I think the third year rotation should be more organized and more coordinated because that is where most students get divergent um, teachings from various teachers, both in terms of skill and just the knowledge. Of course, the first year basic knowledge is quite similar and the exam is very similar to the, the one offered to MMED students. But later on, um, the rotations are what strengthens the program for STP. So now you may need to note that um, eventually there was a change in, in, the, in, in the approach by some um, mentors. I think quite a number came on board and they actually started uh, teaching the STP students because they realize that um, it is just important to support this program just like the, the MMED um, program because more people are being reached by these uh, semi-specialists in the various um, provinces. Now, 
Of course, there was minimal support from the government, especially for the students, and there's actually no uh, financial support from the government for the mentors, which of course um, uh, was not quite good, but I think with time, um, we need to make the college uh, self self-sufficient in terms of funds. Maybe an introduction of a, a fee uh, that, um, of course the fees are already there, but just to strengthen uh, the, the, the MOH remitting funds to the college for the GRZ sponsored students, because this will make the work easier. In terms of accreditation, we need um, a very huge number of divergent lecturers coming in from different institutions and of course, international uh, tutors or lecturers who should come in and all those I think will need funds. So we really need to find a way of making the college self-sufficient. Of course, with uh, an increase in GRZ, meeting the, the amount of money that they are supposed to meet for the students that they are, they are sponsoring. So eventually, I think you, what we noted at the end for the first uh, exit exams is that some departments were quite coordinated, while well, in other departments, we saw that there were issues in exams. Some students were told to go back after the theory to come back and um, do the, the practicals later. Of course, this mostly was due to finances, and that is why we're emphasizing that I think the ZAPOM should be made self-reliant. Otherwise, these are two entities that should be allowed to go together, the MH program and the STP program. So basically, I think those are the, the views that I gathered from my colleagues that were trained last year and those that exited the college uh, uh, in 20, uh, 2021. I submit chair. Uh, at this point, I, I invite the rapporteur to come and just uh... Um, lead us into question and answer, and finally, uh, closure. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Dr. Moyo. Um, we'll first start with the questions from the audience present. Uh, is uh, Dr. Francis Mumpeta or Professor Sekelani Banda. Uh, we'll start with three questions from the audience, then afterwards we'll switch to three questions from the people joining us online. Start with first question from the audience. Uh, thank you so much. My name is uh, Dennis. Dennis yes. yes. Um, I happen to be the Secretary General for the Zambia Medical Students Association of Zambia. Yes. Um, Professor, I'm, 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 I'm very excited having an, an understanding from 1964 to currently where we are today, and you've enlightened the house on a number of issues. Um, my concern is especially on the issues of youth love and also the issues of uh, harmonization of curriculums. This is in relation to the new introduction and pronouncement of the HPCZ that uh, all executive students uh, after graduation shall be subjected to that exam. Um, my, my question is that why is it not, is it possible for the fraternity to introduce the same exit exams and like introducing it at a later stage after graduating from the various schools? Why can't we have one exit exam for all the nine medical universities across the country? Then uh, my other question is uh, looking at the numbers that we are having in terms of uh, 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 students that are training at various levels in relation to the skills labs. Today, if you're going to walk at the DR, end of the DR, down, down the basement there, you realize that looking at the numbers that are being enrolled, the, 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 the skills labs cannot accommodate the, the students. Now, you also mentioned one of the aspects of looking at medicine to be an aspect of an online perception. How then would be these skills be translated into us or into the students that are training at various levels? I thank you. Okay, anyone else? Yes, Dr. Ngolube. 
Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm um, your familiar manager. Uh, uh, chairperson or president. Um, my question is uh, basically with regards to postgraduate training. Um, I have clearly understood that uh, the profiles highlighted that uh, um, there is basically two streams, which is one a professional and the other, which is uh, academic. Um, my question comes just from, from there. Um, is it possible then if the two need to coexist the professional training as well as the academic training? Is it possible that, or how can we make it possible that the two coexist and receive similar privileges so that those that intend to take on either uh, do so without any strain. For example, today, uh, it's a, if I do SDP, I will do it with the scholarship from the ministry, and I won't have to pay um, anything for me to do SDP. Well, if I choose to do the academic, and which is 10 minutes, it means I have to sponsor myself. So it forced me uh, you or the population onto getting onto the professional, yeah, onto the professional uh, program and not the, the academic one. In my opinion, I feel that uh, by sponsoring one and not the other, uh, is somehow making it difficult for the two programs to coexist because I feel like that we are together in one and not the other. What is there anything that needs to be done to ensure that those who want to undergo this uh, postgraduate studies are doing it uh, with the support from government like SDP in that um thank you very much um uh, I'll begin with uh, what uh, Dennis asked. Um, with a focus on harmonization of curriculum, I know that a lot of people talk about uh, harmonization of curriculum, but they mean different things. Harmonization, standardization, people are trying to say that all the universities must have the same curriculum. Now, this is where we need to unpack it a bit. All universities should have the same endpoint outcomes. So you can define the outcomes that one should be able to do a comprehensive sensitive history, one should be able to do a full physical examination or a focused examination, generate differential diagnosis, instigate or initiate appropriate investigations, uh, be the lab or chemical imaging and come up with a working diagnosis and formulate a treatment plan. That is the end point in a nutshell. But how do you get to that end point? There are different kinds of educational philosophies. There are some people who believe in drilling people and testing them and drilling them. So they are traditional. They'll give lectures, they'll give repeated tests, they'll give quizzes because they believe that's where people learn the best. But there's another school of thought that believes that people learn better if they have experiential hands-on. So they want more of a discovery nature. So you find some universities are anchored on a problem-based curriculum, and some universities are anchored on a traditional approach. Some universities are divided into departments, disparate entities, anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, and some universities want a system-based curriculum. They want you to learn cardiovascular, they want you to do renal. 
and you do all the anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, and pharmacology related to Reno. So those are different approaches. But at the end of the day, they must end up with the same end outcomes. So the role of the regulator, for example, HPCZ, when they do a licensing exam, is to examine on the outcomes and not on the process. So the process is left to the university, but the outcome which will impact the practice is what they are interested in. So it allows people to have different approaches based on their educational philosophies. So when we say harmonization or standardization, we must be clear what we mean. So most educators will not prescribe the process. They will prescribe the outcome, the competencies at the end of the training journey. So same exit university rather than after graduation, in part speaks to what I've just said. In the end exam, the university may want to ensure that certain things that are specific to their curricula are represented in their exit exam. It would obviously be more efficient if we said all grad, final years sit the same exit exam, but it may not account for the different processes. And remember, a regulator as HPCZ, for example, does not dictate the nature of the curriculum. It dictates in broad strokes the content and the outcomes. So you would have to grapple with the logistics of the same exit exam when they have different curricula. Yeah, so the role of um, skills lab, of course, the numbers are a challenge outstripping the capacity of the labs and each institution must be tasked to make sure that their enrollments match the capacities. The role of uh, practicals on online teaching, again, we need clarity. There are things that are suitable for online training and there are things that are suitable which are practical. People will stretch the argument that you can demonstrate how to palpate for a spleen by doing YouTube videos and demonstrating them and giving people a work-based checklist and somebody else certify. But there's, there's a time for hands-on. The haptic skills can only come from actually touching the patients and actually doing the examination. So what I was basically referring to is for instance, lectures. You can listen from, to a lecture from your room on your laptop with your virtual. You can listen to a pre-recorded lecture. You can have your notes, you have your textbooks, which are available online. So now what the, exam, the educators need to do is focus on signposting for you the things that are important and driving you to become a critical thinker and the problem self. Because information alone does not translate into knowledge. So the educator's role is to see how they can draw that information and make you start to apply it to higher cognitive skills, I mean, higher thinking capacity, so that you become a critical thinker and you are able to apply that information. So the roles of the educator are changing from those who just used to come and give you the facts. In fact, those are the worst kind of lecturers who come to a classroom and read off a textbook sentence for sentence. Why do you go to such classes? Dr. Ngurube, STP and uh, uh, MEDS, the professional and the academic. Now, we need to differentiate that there are institutions that are training and there are institutions that are consumers. The Ministry of Health in Zambia is the largest consumer of products from the pipeline. They have their priorities. The Zambia Army, for instance, is also another consumer or the Defense Forces. The councils are another consumer for their products. Each of these have got their different budgets, different pain points in how they operate, 
what their debt burden is and what. So they are not the ones to determine which and how we run the institutions. I know it's not an easy assumption to try and ignore the Ministry of Health because the Ministry of Health is a big player. But as an institution that is offering MMED, I'm with the investor of Zambia now, I think the investor of Zambia should focus on strategies on how to lobby the ministries and to show them the benefits of what the uh, academic qualifications will have, especially on the role of faculty, in that if the pipeline is going to be active, we need people who are active researchers and educators who will support this pipeline in future, rather than people who are just whipping prostates out every day as clinicians. They need to know that somebody had to train those people on how to do that process. So as an institution, we are the ones that should come out with strategies to try and get the consumers to support our projects. The ministry's uh, priorities are based on their understanding on what these roles are. As an institution, we should focus on seeing, making them see otherwise and see other consumers different models of how to, to support uh, education. So it's not for them to determine uh, uh, to the pipeline or the training institutions, which one over the other. Of course, we know that from economics, the one that receives more, it becomes easier for people to enroll. But uh, as a university, what do we do? It's time to engage the ministry, try and show them otherwise, and also broaden our catchment to beyond the ministry and also find ways in which we can facilitate people who opt for our methods. Uh, Dr. Ampeta talked of staff development fellows, people who want to become future faculty. How do we find resources to support them? So at the end of the day, it's clarity on the role of the provider and clarity on the preferences of the consumer. We can lo only lobby, we cannot dictate. It is not our role. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, I would, would like to stop here, but before we close, I'd like to just give a summary of what we've discussed today. Given the, given the background by Professor Sechalani Banda, you can see that we're coming from um, a very, very um, steep place where we only had 13 students in 1973 and the MBCHB program. Then over the years, um, we've seen that there's been a steady increase in the number of students. We've seen there's a steady increase in the number, in the number of postgraduate programs that are being done. And then also you have to note that we had doctors being sent out abroad to do their postgraduate program but later on uh, in 1985, it was then uh, the government and the medical profession sat down to see if they can train their own doctors. And after that, we've seen that the STP program was also introduced in about uh, 2018 to see how we can marry the clinical need as well as the academic need. Then we've had some challenges, as you can see, we had. 13 doctors at undergraduate level. Now we have uh, over, we have over 1,200 doctors that are languishing in the streets. But because of this unemployment, people are saying, what's going to happen with the uptake? But the most important thing that we've been talking about is that there's need to understand the demand and supply how many doctors are needed at a particular time, how many doctors are ready to be absorbed in the various sectors. There's a need for the trainers to sit down and uh, to, sit down with the, to sit down with the consumers, which is government, the private sector as well can come in. We can sit down with the Ministry, ministry of Defense as well to see how many doctors can be consumed at a particular time to avoid, the, uh, to avoid issues of where we have doctors who are done, who are done with school, uh, but are not being employed. Then 
interesting away from this, some people were talking about the need for HPCZ to come in to see if not only doctors who are government employed can have their exams in good time, because there was a need, there was a question, I think it needs some clarity. Someone asked, why is it that uh, only doctors who have been, um, who are under government are being sponsored? Only doctors who are under government are being given licensure, are, are being awarded licenses, which is not very true. HPCZ needs to come in concerning that. Way forward is that we need to locate the medical education where the health system is. Because when we locate the education uh, system where the health system is, we cater for the need and the demand and the ratio. We need to look at the future of training. There is, we need to look at the future of training where after MBCHB, you need to understand that there's a clinical aspect and there's a professional, there's a professional aspect. When you're starting your when you're starting your postgraduate training, you need to understand that you can take the academic route, you can take the clinical route, even the administrative route. A professor gave a good uh, illustration of two people who've been in the profession for some time and how they look after that. You need to understand that for you to be a professor, you need to go to the academic route. For you to be a consultant, you need to go the clinical route. That's very, very important. Then we had one medical school that was the, uh, um, the university teaching hospital. CBU came in in 2011, but at the moment we have nine schools, private and government owned, but there's need for standardization. Professor talked about the need to also standardize the clinicians to to standardize the scholars and also the administrators. There needs to be accreditation of these, uh, these three aspects of, uh, of career path. So therefore, HPCZ as well needs to come in. We need, we as the medical education need to come in as well and also talk to HPCZ concerning accreditation of, uh, of these three uh, path, career paths. So, and then when, with regards to licensure exams, uh, people have preferred, uh, some students have preferred exit exams and they've said, why not have an entry exam and an exit exam? The problem has been HPCZ cannot dictate how the institution decides to train a medical student, but other, it can, what it can do is assess how ready an institution, how ready an institution has prepared this person for, uh, for, for practice. Is this person safe to patients? Is this person uh, a hazard to patients? So that has been the problem. So there's need for harmony in terms of HPCZ and the institutions, if they can go back to the table and agree on a curriculum that would be better. Then um, moving forward, there's also a need for the, for the STP program to be given more attention uh, because some of the problems that they've had is that there's demotivated lecturers. They are mostly used as a workforce. So that impedes on the, um, on the quality of education as they are not being um, mentored as they should be. They need more mentorship and more attention. One of the things that they've given as a big problem is um, the lack of motivation from the lecturers. Lecturers are given little to no financial support. Most of the things that they have to do is from their pocket. Therefore, there's need for ZACOMs to be financially independent because if they're financially independent, they might be able to sponsor these lecturers. Then there's, there's also a query concerning STP being given more attention uh, as compared to MED. But then Professor guided us that it's not, you have to understand that there's a role of a consumer 
and the role of uh, someone who's doing the supply. The trainers and the consumers need to, uh, need to sit down. It's a role of the training institutions to let the consumers, which is MOH, uh, Minister of Defense, understand the need of uh, postgraduate uh, MED degree as opposed to STP. But at the end of the day, both are needed because they supplement each other. There's a need for academic uh, route. There's a need as well for clinical route. Uh, having said that, I'd like to thank everyone who's tuned in. So okay. What you were saying, even about the uh, that exams, uh, HPC that license is not going to be one you come on. Yeah. What we try to say is, uh, why is it that there are so many medical students that are graduating? Why do they have to go to a government internship only for them to get that HPC that full license? Okay. That's good. Okay, I think this is a that's a very very valid point. Uh, I think we have to sit down with HPCZ. I will clarify on that. The question is, why does someone have to go through government internship to get a full license? Is it? Why government? Okay, okay, Doctor. Just to, just to clarify to some people who could not get Dr. Moyo, was, the question was, why is, uh, why is it that for you to do your internship, uh, for you to be given a full license, you have to do your internship at, at a government institution? And then the answer was that because of uh, HPCZ has uh, accredited certain institutions, certain sites, to do the internship because internship is part of training. But over the years, some of those private sec some of those institutions in the private sectors have been falling short of uh, the benchmark of uh, accreditation of these institutions as internship site. Maybe of, of importance is that the private sector can come in to pull up so that they can also absorb some of these doctors while they do their internship because there's a lot of need for the private sector to come in and be part of the market for these doctors so that these doctors can be absorbed into the private sector. 